What's up, Blueprint? And what's up to all those that are joining us outside of our Blueprint family? Over the next few weeks, we've decided to use our platform to authentically and collectively cry out to one another and to God in the face of the injustices that's taking place in our country. So we've named this series, Our Outcry, an authentic lament in the face of injustice. You see, at Blueprint Church, we believe that the gospel changes people and God uses people to change the world. Now, while we fully embrace this statement, we also have to come to grips with the reality that as humans, we all face our limitations because we are all poor in spirit. You see, this is not a disclaimer that we should stand pad or, and do nothing. Actually, I'm proud of the many of you who have been crying out in the face of injustices this week, you know, because the reality is that this week has been not easy. Right? We have to relive the murder of Ahmaud Arbery. We have to lay to rest the body of George Floyd, all in the midst of the continual protests. But the question is not what do we do or how do we act? The question is, is like how do we properly lament in the face of what's going on? How do we embrace what God is calling us? Because if it's true that the gospel changes people and God uses people to change the world, then our prayer is that God, you would grant us the serenity to accept the things that we can change and the courage to do that and the wisdom to know the difference. So Lord, this whole series is about you hearing our outcry, accepting our lament. And what I'm going to be doing today is this, we're going to be with um, a few people that I know and love. One, my wife, Angie a good friend and member, Chad, and a beloved Stephanie. And we're going to be using 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 19 to 27 to frame it. And it says this, although I'm free from all men, I have not, I've made myself a slave to all in order to win more. To the Jews, I became like a Jew. To win Jews, to those under the law, I became as one under the law, even though I'm not under the law of God, to win those under the law. To those who are without the law, like one without the law, though I'm not without God's law but under the law of Christ to win those without the law. To the weak I became weak in order to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by every possible means may save some. Now I do this all because of the gospel that I might share in the blessings. I love that passage because the passage goes on and tells you, don't you know that you're running the race and the way we run the race, that we run in a way to win the prize? Not everyone who competes tries to exercise, needs that competes, they exercise self-control to win not a perishable crown, but an imperishable crown. So Paul says, so I don't run like one who runs aimlessly, boxing, you know, beating the air, but instead I discipline my body, bringing it under control so that when I preach to others that I might not disqualify myself. You see, throughout all of his missionary journeys, Paul would oftentimes be met with cultural distinctives that would cause others of his background to question his commitment to his own cultural heritage. We see this twice in, in scriptures that call for his disciples that were with Paul to be circumcised. Once it was with Titus and once it was with, with Timothy. In Acts chapter 16, we see with Timothy, he allowed it. But with Titus, he, in Galatians chapter 2, he went to the ends to not allow it to happen. You see, it's these principles like this that really help us to shape and to contextualize the gospel, and specifically in times like this. So I really want for us to begin to ask and answer the questions of how do we address these things? How do we um, push into these things? How do we become all things to all men, but at the same time saving some without understanding, without understanding all people? And so there's a few questions that we're going to be asking our panelists today. How do we become all things to all men as a white Christian? But we're also going to be asking and answering the question is how do I know when to conform to the cultural pressures or when I confront the cultural pressures? And then finally, I just want to know as, this, like, as a white Christian, what are some of the pressures that they feel you know, in the face of, in, in the face of these injustices in the times like this. And again, let me just lay this disclaimer. You know, we're going to be doing it this week with white Christians. Next week, we're going to be talking more to some more minority Christians. But no one is answering for everyone. Every culture is nuanced. And so I'm asking them to simply answer the questions based upon their experience, not trying to speak for everyone's experience. So join us as we enter into this conversation, as we authentically lament in the face of injustices. 
What's up, Blueprint Church? I am here. I am excited to continue in our series on our outcry and authentic lament in the face of injustice. I'm excited, you know, to have three distinguished guests. And yes, all of our three distinguished guests are white. Um, over these next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about, like, I wanted to get an honest and truthful conversation because we've been talking about our outcry. And, you know, and I hear a lot of by, back and forth that's going on um, when it comes to um, the, the outcries and just the different people outcries. And so I wanted to just talk about just what are the personal struggles, like get into the heart and the mind of the conversation and what that looked like. I'm going to try to be quiet a lot for this and, you know, just kind of stir up the dust and allow people to hear. And next week, we're going we're gonna to have an all minority, you know, um, context. And so I'm just really excited about just having truthful and honest conversation and just talking about it because, you know, since last week when, when Wesley, Wesley talked about the idea of the prophetic lament, I just think it's really important for us to give platforms for the voices to, to cry out. You know, and that's really what we're trying to do here is um, I told them at the very beginning, our goal is not to try to fix anyone. We're not trying to fix white people. We're not trying to fix black people. What we're trying to do is, is to create a space for a truthful and honest conversation that they can authentically lament uh, um, in the face of injustice. So I wanted them to, per to talk about their personal wrestle, their personal struggle in um, this times. And so this has been a hard week. You know, we've had the the George Floyd funeral this week. We've also had the beginning of the trial of Ahmaud Arbery, and so like the recurrence, and we're still in the face of, yeah. um, of the protest. Um, there's all these things that's going on, and so um, we've already kind of framed it. First Corinthians chapter nine is the, is the text, you know, becoming all things to all men. And Paul says that so that I might save some. As a believer in Jesus Christ, my first question for you guys, for you guys to kind of wrestle around with is, as a white Christian, what does it mean to become all things to all people, and specifically in times like this? Chad, why don't you um, <laughs> kick us off with that? Um, so that's a great question, Dottie. I'm so glad you asked it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, when we think in terms of like, your question, what does it mean for a white Christian to become all things to all people? Um, I can honestly say I don't think white Christians have ever answered that question. I think they've answered the question, what does it mean for me as a Christian to be all things to all people? But as a white Christian, I don't think they've ever had to answer that. And I think primarily it's because white people don't think in terms of their whiteness, hmm. right? So um, Brian Loritz says it this way. He's like, imagine that you know we live in a two-arm society um, and you never think about having two arms, but if one person has one arm, they're always gonna view everything through the reality of their limitations, right? Yeah. So it's like me complaining about, man, I can't do a pull-up or a push-up because I'm too weak or my arms aren't long enough, and the guy with the one arm saying, and I've only got one arm, I can't do any of those things, right? It's, it's not even a comparison. And so, um, so I think when we, the first time that I ever had to, I think, deal with that was when I became the minority in a group of people, right? It was the first time I started teaching at a school. It was an all-black school. There were only three white teachers there, and that's when I was confronted with, oh, I'm around a group of people that really don't have anything in common um, compared to what the people I normally hang out with have in common, and I had to really wrestle through, okay, like, what part of my identity needs to shed? What part of my identity needs to stay? And how can I really relate to these people um, in a way that I've never really had to try to figure out before. Yeah, and I think that's really important and specifically a part of white privilege. And, you know, oftentimes when people, when people of white um, come to me and I ask them, did you know what it's like to be a minority? And if you don't, go on a mission trip and then embrace yeah. the insecurities, embrace the things and understand that it is, but understand that you're coming back. But I also want you to recognize that for many minorities, they're in that and they're, they can't go anywhere. And so yeah. how does the gospel answer those questions? So that's a, that's a great answer. Stephanie, what about you? Yeah, I think, I mean, particularly pointing, playing off what Chad said too, you can't become something, you can't move until you know where you are. And so if you haven't, if you haven't done work to become aware of your own whiteness, your own culture, then you don't know where you're going to become anything to anyone. So you've got to know and have an awareness there before. And then I think it takes a great deal of, um, of humility and a willingness to then, okay, I've recognized that like, these things are actually not normal. They're just, they're my culture. And now, now that I know that, I know that I can surrender them. I know I can lay them down. I can submit them. And um, I mean, I think I've seen 
my background and my schooling and all of that is in global studies, intercultural studies, and I've seen missionaries who have incredible tools for engaging with different cultures never apply it here. We know how to go to a foreign country and navigate not even knowing the language and we think about what are our hand gestures do and how do we show kindness and how do we enter in and we come home and we expect to just be able to do our own culture and everyone is like us not recognizing that engaging here in america is a cross-cultural experience and so we have to take those same tools for engaging with different cultures and apply them in our home And um, I just, I think that's a, in order for us to be able to be all things to all men, we've got to know where we are, who we are, so that we can then lay it down. Um, And I think we have to get some skills in it. Yeah, that's a really good word. So we got to be better and effective missionaries, people who are contextualizing. And that's the very essence of becoming all things to all men. You know, and for you and Chad, I know that you guys have, most of your upbringing was in predominantly white backgrounds and, you know, in settings. And if you, I mean, your middle school and your high school, you were the minority, you know, in that and becoming all things to all men, you know, I mean, obviously you wasn't raised in the church, but, you know, right. now when you think about the, the face of injustice, what does it mean for you to become all things to all men? Well, I was thinking about when both of you guys said that, um, Steph said, like, until you know who you are, you're not able to um, engage other people, yeah. people as a whole, anybody. Mm-hmm. But I think in, when you don't know someone else's story, like, mm-hmm. I hear so many judgmental comments in my own mind and in, mm-hmm. you know, at large. And when you stop and pause and you think, wait, I don't know their story. Mm-hmm. So, wait, I'm judging that and I don't know their story. So, if I was in the exact same scenario, what would I do? And I can't answer that question until I know their story. Yeah. And That's so good. I used to, or That's we've really always told the kids, especially when we moved into this neighborhood, people are people, and everybody has a story, and you dare not judge them until you learn it. And I think that's just a, um, I agree with Chad, like I don't think about my Christianity from a white perspective. I wonder if, partly for me, that's, I don't know that the white makes sense to me, like in this world, and I don't think the black makes sense to me in this world. There's a lot of, um, I'm not of this world, kind of, uh, well not mm. kind of, I'm just not of this world, so neither category makes sense to me, but I think, like you also said, I might be more of like a third culture kid in the sense of middle and high school, I was minority, I got that privilege of not, I mean there's six or seven other white kids at my school and that was it, so I had to quickly figure out who I was, not who I was as the, mm. you know, the, mm. I can go on That's and good. on, but yeah. Um, I think until I know my own story, and I'm even willing to share my story with you because somebody might walk in and be like, oh, Angie and Stephanie probably had the same upbringing, mm-hmm. kind of like what we were talking about in the beginning. Yeah. Um, that couldn't be further from the truth. <laughs> yeah. And just because we're both white and just because we're both living in the same neighborhood now, you know, like that's not true. So learn my story. And my goal as a white Christian, I guess to answer your question, is I need to know your story, but I need to share mine as well because there's so much that we can, um, you know, we've talked before about like, it doesn't matter what color you are when your child hurts, a mother hurts for the child, you know, like there's a mother's cry um, that's similar. Like Jackie can hurt for her kids and I can see her hurting for her kids and I hurt because Jackie is hurting. Where I can see Steph Mm -hmm. hurting for Caden and I can hurt for it. There's just something about being a mom that Mm. you can relate to moms, you know, like it. And so I, I think, knowing my story being able to share in that with other people and then learning other people's story is and that's that's really good i mean the idea of white privilege is a a topic that we constantly are talking about and there definitely is a white privilege Mm -hmm. i mean i don't think anyone denies the fact that there is a white no, privilege. Lots of people deny that. Yeah, <laughs> that is well, true. I guess they do. Seems like well, most of America they, does. They, they are denying. Well, they may deny that there is a white privilege, but I guess in the denial, I mean, just even hearing the different ways that you guys have responded, just says that like having options yeah. gives you mm-hmm. this privilege in order. But what I keep hearing each one of you guys are talking about is is that identity drives activity, right? Yeah. And what's interesting, what you were saying, Chad, is that sometimes in, as being white, that there's no real foundational identity 
that you have that we're forced to have as African Americans or as different mm -hmm. minority yeah. groups is that I know I'm coming in and I know that you see my blackness regardless if you're you're saying you're colorblind or not. No, you see my blackness. You see those yeah. truths and those realities. And I think that that's really, really important. And that's kind of leads me to the second question. Like right now, we've been talking about a controversial thing, There's like this idea that I don't think that anybody, that there needs not be any real controversy, the idea of black lives matter. Mm -hmm. But what's controversial oftentimes is whenever someone says black lives matter, then someone automatically would say all lives matter. Always. And I yeah. understand the sentiment, but the problem is, is that if we reverse it, is that we're saying is that if your statement is true, that all lives matter, then we have to say that black lives matter. Right. And, and if we're gonna say that all lives matter, when we see black lives not mattering, then your statement is not being true and not being carried out. Right. So with black lives mattering, that brings up to that, that, that point of what Paul says, I don't lose my identity. I become all things all men. To the Jew, I become like a Jew. To the Gentile, like a Gentile. To those under the law, I become as one under the law, even though I'm not without the law of Christ. To those without the law, I become one without the law, even though I have the law of God. Mm -hmm. So he never loses his identity in there. And so what we've seen and what we talked about is that there's certain times that he's conforming and sometimes he's confronting, but he never loses his identity. So as a white evangelical Christian, right, if, that, if I can say that to you, I mean, uh, if I can embrace that. <laughs> yeah, uh, as a white evangelical Christian, when do you conform and when do you confront the status quo? Angie, why don't you start us off? Um, well, I think mine was going to go back to just the idea of knowing people's stories. Like when I've, okay, so I don't know exactly what you mean by status quo. Right. So I'm going to go with my own. Okay, well, the status quo that I, that I was referring to at the beginning and framing it was the simple fact of circumcision, specifically. Okay. Yeah. Is that, that Paul knew that circumcision wasn't a demand yeah. that God put for in the New Testament. But on one, with Timothy, he was just like, I'm going to get you circumcised. But with Titus... He was like, no. He, said, no, and he, fought he was no, yeah. and he fought it, and even to the point like, I'm gonna go to Jerusalem, and I'm gonna like go beyond to fight and say that this is not right. Like, mm -hmm. and even like, like there was times where I had to confront Peter and I had to stand mm -hmm. up to him in his face, like because he was leading others astray. So it's just like, yeah. so well, how how do you know? I think it's about knowing people's stories and knowing where they're where they're at and what. Um, I think it's interesting. I've had a lot of confrontational conversations this past week, even, and um, I, one, I'm not good at conforming because I, I think the and and you guys might hear that differently than what I mean it, but I feel like my identity in the Lord, like who He's called me to be, is what I can only thing I can conform to. So that's my goal and that's my aim. When I get around all whites, I don't turn into a different Angie. And when I get around mm -hmm. all blacks, I don't turn into a different Angie. And when I'm in a mixed crowd, I'm not a different. Like I'm, I really That's aim great. to be the same yeah. person. So, um, but I had a conversation, a phone call, and I'm having it in front of one of my daughters, and it's on speaker, and I'm speaking to an African American mom, and um, and she's saying, you know, I, I just don't get why people are out there protesting. I don't mm -hmm. understand what's going on. It's just foolishness. Da -da -da. And I'm like, really? You don't understand? Like, you don't get it? I feel like I get it. And I, I start going on to like, man, it gives us, it gives a voice. Like, and, and, pe and I'm seeing it through my daughter, like, who won't stay away from the protest. And, I'm, you know, so I'm kind of sharing my heart. And she's like, no, it's just, it's, it's foolishness. Like, it's only, the only thing that can come of this is somebody's going to get hurt, this and that. And so we're having the conversation. And she's like, we need to trust the system. Everybody just needs to sit down and trust the system. And I was like, the system, the system is what has, and so like we're, we're arguing mm -hmm. and I, I kind of reach a point where I'm like, okay, hmm. I, th I think this is my, I draw a line in the sand at this point. Like I said what I, you know, we're still friends and we're, we, we had an amicable end of the conversation. But when I hung up the phone, I look at my daughter and she's looking at me and I said, wow, that was interesting, right? And she was like, Yes, you would have thought that was a white woman. <laughs> and I said, yeah. And she said, mm. and I said, and if it were, what would you have said? And she was like, I would have challenged you that you needed to have kept going. And I was like, but because it's a black woman, what? And she was like, she's entitled to her opinion. And I was like, huh. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. there is this, I, I feel that too as a, a, a white woman. Like I don't, 
like I can, I will go further probably in a white conversation and argue and, and you know, like, no, I need you to understand this. I need you to hear this. But in that one, I, I was like, hmm. Yeah, and I think that that's it. Wow. And that, that's why what I love is that God is raising up prophets in our day. And it's really important for us, you know, to continue to use our prophetic voice. And what you talked about, like, like you're a prophet, you mm -hmm. know, and, and I think that, that that ability to stand, you know, stand for God regardless, I think is, is critical. So yeah, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Steph, what about you? Yeah, I think for me, like the, the things that come to my mind when I hear that question instantly are kind of the same conversation that sometimes Christians have about like, how do we do grace and truth? Right. And mm. do you do grace or do you do truth? And how do you do them both together? And that's kind of the same conversation I'm hearing. Like, do we conform? Do we confront? Um, and, I, and it takes me back to like going, where is the voice of Jesus here? Because there's so many voices. And that's been my personal struggle is like I'm following a lot of different leaders who I, I know personally and I trust them who are saying very different things. Mm -hmm. And then this week and the last two weeks in particular, I've been introduced to some new leaders who I don't know personally, but who people have told me they know and trust who are saying really powerful, profound things that are very different. And so I read one post, and I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. I think you're right. I'm with you. And then I read the next post, and I'm like, wait, they disagreed with you. Maybe I need to just, and I don't, and I feel this floundering, this wavering in me of, of are you right? Am I, I'm just, I don't know. I'm, I'm coming in assuming that there's, I just know I have a lot to learn here. And so I, I find myself going, Lord, where is your voice? Because what I need to know is what do you think? Yeah. And that's what gives me the courage to say, and we have to be willing to be nuanced yeah. because I can't just say you posted something and I disagree with it and I'm unfollowing you because then I stop learning, I stop growing, mm -hmm. um, and I just don't think it's that simple. And so we have to be willing to like, okay, I'm going to stay with Jesus. I'm going to fight to hear his voice and be willing to be nuanced and go, well, I kind of agree with this part, but I think this is the voice of Jesus here and I'm going to lean toward that and that kind of like, whose side are you on? I'm on the Lord's side. And that's where I want to stay, even though there's a part of me that like, but I want to be with my friends and family, and I don't want to disagree with them. Right. And so I really want to be on their side. Right. And so I'm scared to disagree, you know, not necessarily even with white people. There's a lot of times if my black friends post something and I don't agree, I'm scared to disagree because I don't want to not be with you. Right. I want to be with you. And that's why I think unity in the body is really important is because we're saying we're with Jesus. Yeah, All of us are with Jesus. Yeah. So I think that's what gives us the courage and then trusting the Holy Spirit to discern. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think that's, that's spot on, and I think that's a great way and a great perspective to look at it. Chad, what about you? <laughs> uh, so I have two thoughts. Uh, the first thought is that I think this is a problem. Every culture, every generation, every country is that we look to culture and society to define the status quo, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's our first mistake is that we're not allowing Scripture to define what we should be standing up for. So 39 years old, I grew up in, I lived in a minority neighborhood, uh, grew up in a white church, white friends. We had 4th of July patriotic services on Sunday, right? We'd stand up and pledge allegiance to the flag. And so I was definitely raised with that uh, arsenal of ammunition, how to combat abortion, how to combat um, people who taught that the uh, world wasn't created in six days and God rested like the million took a million years or whatever it was. And so there were certain beliefs and values that I was taught to like stand up for. Um, but I grew up hearing uh, prejudices comments. Right. I remember the first time I had a crush on an African-American girl. I remember I came home and I was talking through like, hey, so is it OK to <laughs> marry a black person? And I remember being told, I mean, it's not a sin, but, you know, having mixed kids, you know, it's probably just not a good idea, right? Mm -hmm. So I just grew up hearing this stuff, being around like, hey, you know, we don't go to Lenox Mall on Friday nights. It gets dark over there, right? Hearing these, like, socially mm -hmm. acceptable, like, bias, prejudice, like, we're calling it out, just I, I'm racist I'm offended comments. right now. Right? I mean, like, I, like, I was just like, it gets dark. I was like, wait, it got dark. Oh, it gets like, dark. So no, 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 I, no, I, I got it out. Okay. Yeah, don't, 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 I'm already <laughs> offended. Okay. There you go. So, go ahead, continue. Right, but, so, or even, like, no, we don't go to that Kroger. It's a mixed crowd. Right. As a white person, I would assume any white person that's you've heard those things before. And we know that they're talking about that means there's black people there and they're changing the dynamic of what that is. Right. So so growing up in that, like I wasn't taught that that's wrong to say those things. Yeah. I wasn't taught. And so 
The second thing, the status quo changed when I uh, came under black leadership. When I started working in an African-American school, when I started uh, coming to Blueprint and serving on staff, the men who were shepherding me were all black. Some of the godliest men I've ever met before. Um, I remember when Ferguson first happened, uh, Michael Brown, Ferguson first happened, and maybe even Trayvon Martin, but I remember, um, so I was, I was oblivious uh, that black fathers had the conversations with their sons about mm -hmm. the cops. I'd been friends with African-Americans for a long time, just oblivious to that, right? But when that happened, I saw the way that my brothers were responding, and I remember my wife came up to one of them in church and was just like, hey, I'm so sorry what happened, and dude just broke down and started crying, and we realized, and there's something we're not getting about this, because when I hear about a white guy being shot in Wisconsin, I'm like, oh, that's sad, but I don't respond to it the same way that I see the African-American mm -hmm. community respond to a black man being shot, and so we took those steps to learn their stories try to understand where they're coming from, realize that, man, our biblical sense of justice and even just, like, reconciliation and the way race has affected the church and our country, like, man, we've been believing some false things about this yeah. narrative for a long time. So, so, one, allowing the Bible to really establish that status quo and then being willing to confront the lies that we've been believing about yeah. a lot of things and trying to see it from someone else's perspective. Yeah, that's really, really good. And, you know, I just think it goes back to the, 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 this foundational principle that you guys are talking about is is being able to be proactive and to be in that, like allowing and understanding your story to helping other people and creating greater awareness for it. Which leads me to my last question in the few minutes that we have. Um, if you guys can kind of like in a speed round, um, <laughs> share a little bit about like, what pressures, what pressures do you feel to respond, you know, to respond in the face of injustices? Like, you know, there's a lot of pressure, you know, on one end is just like, you guys are silent, meaning you, meaning white people. You're silent. Sure. Like, do I have to riot in order to get something from you? Mm -hmm. Like, you don't, that's the only time I'm here. Like, you're, you're silent. And then when you say something, see, I knew you're racist. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and if you're not saying exactly the way that I want you to respond, like, it's like, there, so there's pressure. I mean, I mean, like, even sure. as I'm saying, there's perceived pressure. And again, obviously, all of us have pressure to some degree, but I want to know about your pressure. Right, and you don't have to speak. You're not speaking on behalf of all white people. <laughs> I want to know your pressure as a white woman, as a white man. Yeah. You know um, that that you have. You know, and again, I took up some of your time. So speed <laughs> round and talk about it. Um, <laughs> let's just go, Angie. Um, well, I'm raising. We're raising minority children, so I think there's hmm. a lot of pressure. Like I've got to educate That's myself, good. in, you know, if I go to the school and I present myself as I just know that I have a position of privilege and, um, and I have a voice and I have an opportunity that maybe another mom might not have. And my kids benefit from it because they have a white mother. And mm. so I, I realize that and I'm privy to that. I know it. Um, but I also feel, so there's, you know, but I, I feel like with, I have a lot of pressure with, um, one of our children, like what's I your, no, what's your children, daughters, yeah. Period. All my children give me pressure, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's a assumption that if I'm quiet, I don't have the right to be quiet. If I don't want to go to the protest, I don't have a right to not want to go to the protest. I, you know, hmm. and I'm like, one, let's hear my story. Remember, I have a story too, and um, you know, one, I don't like crowds. I don't like noise. I don't like, you know, these type of things make me afraid. And I have a military background. I, I don't want to be around the National Guard. I know that they can enforce. You know, like there's all this mm. stuff that's going on in my own mind. But I have a lot. I know that there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of expectation from that side. I know there's a lot of expectation from white people who think that I have the answer and I'm a safe person to come to because I'm married to you. You know, like, hey, let me ask you a question. And I, that's pressure to answer it correctly. Or I don't know, you know, so... Um, and I think that that's really what's important is, and that's what we've been talking about, this whole idea of our outcry, authentic lament in the face of injustice, that everyone has a mic, you know, everyone has a platform and everyone has a voice, and we got to leverage our voices and our platforms for right. the glory of God. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Mm -hmm. Stephanie? Yeah, I mean, I, there's a ton of pressure. I feel internal pressure is just a desire to want to respond, but then I feel a pressure of like, if I make this social media post, then do I feel like I've done it? And then, it, so sometimes I will not do it so that I don't lose this. I need to do something more effective than social media. But then also, in the past couple of weeks, as I've talked to some friends, 
I learned that it is really meaningful if I post. And so there's just so many like variables there that I think it, it, it just goes back to navigating like, Lord, how do you want me to respond right now? Because nothing I can do is perfect. Nobody, I can't, everybody can't agree. If I, if I need three days to be silent, some people are going to have a problem with that. If I, if I know that I need to listen right now and not speak, and that's what you're asking me to do, I have to have courage to do it. And so I think sometimes we just have to, we have to recognize, like, if we're always doing the thing we want to do, I just want to, are we really listening to the Lord? Because sometimes he's going to ask me to speak when I don't want to. And sometimes he's going to ask me to shut up when I don't want to. And so I think going back to, like, am I in line with Christ here? And how does he want me to respond? And I do think social media responses are helpful and important and meaningful, but it can't be all of that. And so then what is it beyond that? And what does it look like with my life and my body? Like, I've been thinking a lot about what does repentance look like with my body to, do, to move toward healing and change. So That's good. Thank you. Chad, take us home. What's up? Uh, <clears throat> so I, I feel pressure from whites not to say anything, okay? Um, and that's not all whites, but I know I see my friends online, and I know a lot of people aren't liking what I'm saying. I see what they're retweeting, what they're liking, and they're not liking my stuff, right? Mm. Um, and I think that I feel that pressure there because I think in a lot of white people's eyes, this is still a great issue, yeah. right? It's still mm. a political issue. It's not a biblical issue. Mm. It's not a gospel issue, right? Um, and then I would say the other pressure that I feel, and I, I'm going to use the word my black family, right? If we're defining the church as a family, right? The fact that my daughters have black aunts and uncles, that they have black cousins, um, right? I, don't, I wouldn't say it's a sense of pressure, but it's a sense of duty of like, I see, like, even what Paul says, like, when one part of your body is mm. suffering, right, we, we yeah. suffer with it, right, and I think for a long time, like, the church hasn't responded, right, they didn't respond with Trayvon, they didn't respond with Ferguson, they didn't respond, the list goes on and on and on, right, and that's just what we're aware of because of technology, and so I think now that the reason there is a lot of frustration, and there is a lot of, uh, almost like it's, uh, you're so afraid of saying the wrong thing because they're, they're so hurt from no one ever saying anything mm -hmm. until all of a sudden it's like George Floyd's the worst thing that's ever happened. And it's like, and this has been happening for a long time. And, right. and we're just now getting it that our body's suffering. It's like, you know, you've got gangrene on your foot and you've been ignoring it. Now it's up to your thigh and you're like, hey, I didn't even see that. I didn't know it started. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a sense of duty of, like, we see our family suffering, right? And we want to we wanna be advocates on their behalf. We want to um, lament with them. We want to call other people to suffer with them. And I think then as, we, as my wife and I are studying more and reading more, uh, we're also having, like, a greater sense of biblical duty and biblical pressure, right? This is the full counsel of God, right, that justice and righteousness, it's the exact same word. It's just used differently in the Bible that— We've, what we've done, I think, as white evangelicals is we've separated those two words from each other. Mm -hmm. And so as we've grown in that confidence of what God's called us to do, right, it is gray online, right? There's a lot of opinions floating around there, right? But I, I feel like part of my sense of duty right now is to educate other people and to be an advocate for the pain that we see our body going through and mm -hmm. trying to help them understand, right, black lives matter, all lives matter. Dead babies matter. All babies matter, right? Sex traffic women matter. All women matter. Why that's just like a circular argument that's not helpful. Like, we feel our family has a duty of, like, man, we want to help people understand where our African-American family is coming from. Yeah. So That's really good. Thank you. Thank you guys for showing up. Thank you guys for being present. Thank you guys for not trying to answer for all white people. Thank you for <laughs> answering for yourself. I mean, that's really important in this day. Yeah. You know, and that's really what this series is about, Blueprint. This series is about... It's our cry out. It's an authentic lament, you know, in the face of injustice. And all we can, when we are crying out, we can only take responsibility and ownership of our cry out. And so I'm really excited about just continuing in the conversation. Join us in the, in the weeks to come. And even after this, um, we want you to join us online. The conversation continues. And so if you're on the web page, just click on the link that joins our, our Facebook Live page. But if you are looking at it on Facebook Live or Facebook, then you want to hit the refresh page. But continue on as we um, continue on in with this conversation.